Uh, hello, welcome to uh, episode 20 of The Board, a bit of a milestone. Uh, I am Gavin Cotton, Agile Coach here at Boost. And I'm joined by... Kirsten Donaldson, um, Agile Coach at Boost also. Um, today we're going to talk about um, a couple of different things, not a real theme running through, but just some things that we've picked up on in the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing we we're going to talk about was something that came up during a discussion we were at the other night um, for Agile Welly. Um, who should be the actor in user stories? So if we're using the formula as an actor, I want to action so that I can achieve, um, is it appropriate to do a story that says as a developer, so as one of the team members? Mm -hmm. Hello. There we go. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's quite an interesting question. And uh, I think most of the people around the table, and personally, um, I feel no, you don't want to start using developer because it's, it's uh, you start on a rocky road then, mm. pretty much. If you start using a developer once, you're going to use them many, many times, and then you're just going to be writing stories um, from the developer's point of view the whole time. And if you can't, really can't think of a, a reason why the end user is going to get value out of the story, I think you've got a few problems there, and mm. you, you might want to you know, reevaluate what the story is actually about and why you're, why you're working on it in the first place. Because mm. it does seem that if you use a developer as the actor, um, then really the devel developer is deciding um, what the value of the story is, yeah, um, yeah. as opposed to the, the product owner who is normally thinking about the value to the business and value to end users. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, is that what came out of the discussion the other night? I can't remember what the actual conclusion of that was. Um, the, well, actually we got interrupted by uh, something, I can't remember if it was somebody serving chips or something or entirely different. Or something knocking a beer over or yeah. something like that. But I mean, if you write a story with, as a developer, I mean, why not write a story as a designer or as yeah, a, you know, a systems admin or anything? So you're really taking the story away from the user. And the whole point of the user stories is I mean, it's called a user story, not a developer story for a start. Good point. Yes, <clears throat> and you are trying to get value to whoever that end customer and user is going to be. Mm -hmm. And that's something you, you always want to try and keep in mind. I realize sometimes it's difficult, especially at the start of a project when you're doing a lot of uh, setup. But uh, mm -hmm. um, how we do it, and this isn't to say it's the right way or the way you should do it, but how we do it here is we try to make sure even the first story cuts through the entire slice of the you know architecture and everything mm. and does deliver value at the end of the day to yeah. the customer. So with web applications and websites, um, there's usually something you can see on the front end, but that first story will include things like server setup. Yeah. It's usually quite a large story, isn't it? Yeah, yeah you, you find, for example, if you have um, a story at the very start of the project, and uh, you have a similarish story further into the project. Further into the project, it's probably going to be sized as a, you know, say for example, a one, and at the start of the project, it might be sized as a, you know, five or something because you do have all that Let's sort of background that. set up to do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, absolutely, you want to deliver that value to the the customer at the at the end of the day. I've seen stories where um, a lot of stories written from the product owner's point of view. As a product owner, I want such and such. And I think that's a little bit mm. dangerous to get into the, the habit of that as well. You have some questions. We've got there. a couple of comments. Um, Tony <coughs> says he's found that um, when they use as a developer, they tend towards a horizontal slice of functionality instead of vertical. And I think that that is the problem, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think so and too. it's an interesting way of describing that, though. Um, and Gareth horizontal says, slice. That's a, that's a, yeah. That's a pretty good way of describing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and Gareth says, um, how do we handle chore activities? Um, can you remind me? It's been a while since I've worked on Well, yes, actually. yes, absolutely. So chore activities, we um, add them to the, the scrum board, but we don't size them because they're usually you know, so small. Um, and if it needs any acceptance criteria or anything in the chore, it's probably a story. Mm. So, uh, and you know, most of our chores take maybe an hour or less or, or something like that, but we still add them to the scrum board. And if you've got some sort of um, electronic mm. um, backup for that, we add it to that as well. Um, just so you've still got the visibility of that and everybody knows that that needs to be worked on and people will still discuss it at stand-up as well but we just don't we just don't size it. So what's an example of a chore like um, setting up? Well it <coughs> might like even be deploying deploying something to production or, or something like that um, or uh, I've seen recently there was a chore and it's just about the CSS, it's just tweaking a little bit of CSS, it was, just wasn't enough to, it was a five minute job right. and yeah. it wasn't enough to constitute a story and it didn't have any yeah. huge impact or anything. But it still needs to be done and usually if it's not on the board it doesn't get done. Yeah, yeah, well that's yeah. right, that's right, yeah, and you, you, I mean part of the point of 
uh, using Scrum, I suppose, is to give visibility and transparency to, mm -hmm. to all the work that you're doing, so you, you do need to, to get it out there. Um, mm -hmm. And there's no point in making stories about things that are going to take 10 minutes, because then you're, you're just, that's time wasted. Yeah. Um, so that's how we deal with chores. I'd uh, be interested to hear how you deal with chores, actually. Yeah, if you want to comment, Gareth, I'll read it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that was an interesting point that came up at Agile. Well, you, the, these people were using as a, as a developer. Um, mm -hmm. And everybody does, does these things slightly differently, but um, we managed to avoid it entirely, and it's, mm. um, it's not like anything's missed because of that. Mm, that's right. So, moving on, um, we were talking with um, Joe, who does the camera work, um, the other day about wrapping up a project. Um, so when you get towards the end, quite often we find that the, the last sprint um, doesn't have a full sprint's worth of work. And um, Joe was talking to us about how to, how to deal with that. Do we take those um, stories that probably won't be completed um, and put them back in the backlog? Um, or do we leave them up on the, the sprint backlog board? Or mm -hmm. how's it dealt with? Um, so we talked a, a bit about that. Um, my, the, the, pro the project we're talking about, um, we've developed a minimum viable product and our product owner will probably be coming back at some stage. So my thoughts were that the stories should just go into the, the backlog um, as the product owner has reached that minimum viable product and the point in their budget where they'd like to go and take it out and mm. test it. Public. So I, I thought it should go back in. Um, what were your thoughts on that? Well, so if I'm understanding it right, they've um, completed most of the work on the project, they've got a final sprint, but finished the work before yeah, the sprint ends. A, yeah, so there was a discussion that, um, with the product owner who said, actually, this is going to be enough for me. Yeah, so they're yeah. sort of mid-sprint. I mean, there's two things here, sort of, you know, we did the stories, go to they immediately go back into the product backlog. But also, how do you sort of um, signify that, that project is finished at that point you know are there any activities you can do especially if you're finishing mid sprint yeah I mean if we're finishing at the end of a sprint normally we might have a um, sort of end project yeah. show covering the whole yeah well time I, sp period. I suppose at the end of the day that's going to be up to the product owner because mm. it's really up to them if a sprint for example if a sprint ha has to be cancelled for any reason it's only mm. really the product owner that can that can make that call Mm. So I guess in the same situation, if they feel that they've got everything that they need, um, mm. they, they can call a halt to it there and then. And that's part of the joy of, of Scrum is having that, that flexibility, really. Mm. Um, and uh, I think it will still be a good idea to have uh, some sort of wrap-up wrap meeting I mean, or retro. Just ask Joe, who's sitting over there, are you going to have a retro at the end of the sprint? And are you going to have it at the normal time that you would have anyway? Or what do you, how do you plan to approach that? So you're going to check with the product owner to see what they want to do. Okay. Um, just to read out Gareth's latest comment as well, um, he says, we don't s size chores either, but in our environment they can be quite large. For example, the latest chore was moving our code repository from SVN to Git. Mm. That's tricky because that is quite a bit of work. Yeah, and that sounds um, like more than just a, well for us, more than just a, a chore that's going to take you know an hour or less. That's quite a substantial, mm. could be quite a substantial a bit of work. So it might be worth capturing that in a story because there's going to be tasks involved in that as well. And usually yeah. a chore um, doesn't have tasks for us. The mm, chore it is, is just a task. It's a task it. unto itself. Yeah. Whereas this is going to have you know tasks um, as a part of it. So how would you, um, just off the top of your head, how would you phrase it, this user story though? Um, to avoid saying, you know, as the project team, we want to move from um, SVN to, to Git. Yeah, well, that's, uh, you're not putting me on the spot with that one <laughs> at all. <laughs> but, um, gosh, I suppose that could be, that is a, a tricky one. You might want to write it as, um, I have to admit, I suppose if we were doing that in our project, we'd probably say as a product owner, I want, uh, I I want so. to be able to um, see deployments happen in a, mm. in a certain way. It, um, would be, it would be basically a project team one, wouldn't it, yeah. as opposed to an end user? Yeah. That's yeah. possibly an exception. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's a tricky one. Um, and I would say it's more than a chore and something that needs to be sized. So how you phrase that story, I suppose, is up to, up to you guys. Um, mm. And I don't know enough about the project to think of a way that you might be able to... Um, well, Gareth's saying the size of the chores is something they're quite concerned about. Uh, um, yes, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you do need to address it, basically. Yeah, because you want this um, to 
be represented maybe by the team's uh, you know velocity at mm. the the end of the day as well because they probably want that to, if it's something that took a lot of their time they want that to count towards that. Absolutely, it's going to be quite misleading if if it doesn't hit yeah. points assigned to it, isn't it? Yeah. And actually, that uh, does bring us on to something else that we're going to talk about today, which is, um, <laughs> which is velocity. And mm. this is something that people have talked about a lot in Scrum and the importance of velocity, and you know maybe the lack of importance of velocity. And um, we've had issues in the past where product owners place too much emphasis on you know a team's velocity, and if mm. it goes. Um, up or down, they question that. Well, if it goes down, they question it. Actually, not, not usually if it goes up. <laughs> More particularly, and yeah. even if you know team members come out of the project for whatever reason, the velocity goes down. There's still concern mm -hmm. um, from the product owner's point of view, even though it's quite apparent why this velocity has gone down. And for me, um, and for most people, I think at this point, they think that velocity is only important to the team, and the team can use it as a guide. Mm. Um, for themselves and to help them decide when they're committing to stuff in sprint planning and I'll just give, give them a good sense of how they're they're tracking mm. um, but I think it's kind of dangerous to be used outside of the team and yeah I mean th that sort of brings on to you know what sorts of um, other measures can we talk to product owners about so that their focus is taken away from velocity mm -hmm. given that that's really there for the team yeah um, when we were talking before the show um, I was talking about things like the quality of the code, so mm. um, perhaps um, defect rate. Yeah, yeah. Um, and team morale as well. Yeah, well, uh, it's really it's uh, at the end of the day, what's important to you and what do you want to measure and what yeah. you know what metrics do you want to measure. And so for us, you know, time to market is pretty important, mm -hmm. and um, you know how often you're actually achieving your sprint goal is important. Yeah, that's true. And yeah, like you said, team morale and, and general happiness is, mm. is important as well. Mm. And um, uh, it's a good measure because the team is not going to be happy if they don't feel that they're achieving what they yeah, need to achieve. Yeah. You know, um, I, I guess it's probably not as um, obvious to a, a product owner that that's a, a good metric though, but I guess it's just a case of explaining yeah, yeah. how that shows progress. Um, people have asked um, how do you quantify the happiness of a team or the, or the team morale and um, I've got a whiteboard. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so I came across something a while ago uh, called the Nico Nico calendar and it's just a, a very quick and easy way of um, judging how happy your team is basically and how they're feeling as your sprint is progressing. So I'll just draw this out very, very quickly here. Um, so at the end of every day, the team leaves for the day and they go out the door and you have maybe a whiteboard or something by the door. And as they're leaving, they will draw either a smiley face or a sad face or a happy face, depending on how they felt that day. Or a neutral face. Or a neutral drawing. face, yeah. <laughs> and... I'll show you this now in one second. It's looking pretty amazing, so <laughs> prepare to be wowed. So um, we haven't got a screen today, so I hope you can actually hope you can actually uh, see this. Joe sees you. Cool. Okay. <laughs> so on the left here, you'd have people's names. This might be like Bernard and Matthew and Dorothy, and here are your days in the sprint: day one, day two, day three. And just as they're leaving for the day, they draw you know happy face or um, you know neutral face or sad face. And it gives you a good sense of how people are feeling, especially over time and then over throughout a sprint. And you can get some good information out of this as well. If everybody's smiley face, but the project is actually not going that well, you know, there's there's a, there might be a little bit of an issue there. Why is everybody so happy when the some project kind is of falling apart? Yeah, affecting the entire team. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> or and these it's not an exact science, this of course, you know, and um, or if. Everybody's got sad faces apart from one person over time. You think, oh, what's wrong? Is there some sort of a, you know, some sort of a developer superstar who's dragging the team down? Possibly, mm. that might need to be looked at. And of course, if everybody's just got sad faces, you know that um, there's a bit of a problem and morale is really low, mm. and that really needs to be looked at. And um, how would you address improved. that if, if you had a whole board of um, sad faces? Well, I'd hope that this stuff will come up in a retrospective, but yeah. if it's a whole board of sad faces, um, perhaps they don't feel like they can talk about that in a retrospective. Mm -hmm. There might be just a really bad feeling um, across the team. So um, if nobody's bringing it up in the retrospective, the, uh, 
Oh, was the scrum master would, would have a look at that? Yeah, I think you'd just get the team together quickly to have a quick chat, really. Maybe yeah, something yeah. a little less formal than yeah. sitting around a table, though. Exactly, yeah. and yeah. just try to get to the bottom, the, the root cause of why everybody's not happy. And it might mm -hmm. be just um, a case of people aren't working together, maybe you have to look mm -hmm. for that. Or maybe there are just problems with the um, with the project itself. There might be stories, or all their stories are too big. There can be an, uh, any number of reasons why it's Absolutely. happening. Yeah. yeah, I think an informal chat in that situation yeah, might yeah. work well. Yeah, exactly. So what else were we going to talk about? Um, so we're also going to talk about the role of the Scrum Master, um, which is kind of an interesting one. And I brought this up recently at uh, one of our scrunch lunch things. And I brought it up because I've been talking to people who are Scrum Masters and people who are Agile coaches and people who are Agile mm -hmm. consultants. And there's a whole breadth of you know um, job titles that, that people mm -hmm. have. And we're Agile coaches here at Boost. And for me, that's very similar to a Scrum Master. Being a good Scrum Master makes you an Agile coach. Mm. And um, I also talked to Nathan here at Boost about um, the role of a Scrum Master. And we mm. sort of uh, saw it in three different parts. Say you're working with a new Scrum team. Um, you're um, acting as a trainer and you're training them how to get involved in the process and how to work together and just make sure that you know they're I suppose doing Scrum uh, as it should be mm. to the, its and full, explaining the effect. reasons why as well. Yeah, abs absolutely, okay. absolutely. And then the the second stage is being a mentor because you've got experience and you're really you know helping the team with your experience. If they have questions, you can mm -hmm. say, well, you know, in the past I've seen this happen yes. before, and yeah. this is what we did. Maybe we could try that. Yeah. So that's uh, a bit more of a mentoring role. Mm -hmm. And then once they're really on their feet and they're um, high-performing scrum team you fall into the coaching role a little bit more which is working with the team and helping the team to come up with their own answers to questions rather than um, being directive being directive exactly mm. um, so for me that's sort of the journey that a scrum master can can actually take mm. and that's why I suppose the term agile coach came up because a lot of people think a scrum master can have you know, five projects on the go, and all they do is facilitate meetings and set mm. up meetings and Dead maintain board. the scrum board. Yeah. And that's not really the scrum master's job at all. You know, mm. usually the scrum master ends up doing that, but it's not really dictated that that's what the scrum master should do. Yeah, so I think agile coach is a good term for covering all those different aspects, though, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, I guess it's different from company to company. Well, uh, that's right. And the scrum guide actually yeah. does have a pretty good um, list of things that the scrum master does and mm. it's basically split into three sections it's the scrum master you know helping out the product owner making sure that everything's going well for the product owner mm -hmm. and then helping out the team making sure that everything's okay with the team and then helping the organization mm. itself as well Gareth said he's going to try out the um, tracking team happiness next week oh yeah so um, so if you want to look that up it's uh, the Nico Nico calendar N-I-K-O N-I-K-O the Japanese um, and we'd be interested to hear Gareth and on how that went and what you were able to find out from that chart yeah yeah and um, that's so quick as well because it takes somebody like half a second at the end of the day to to make their mark as absolutely. well absolutely um, Gareth also says more than just a project manager um, and yeah I mean the, the, oh, yeah, the role yeah. of agile coach scrum master agile consultant vastly different from a project manager yeah I mean I we, would say. we don't even have a project manager no we don't here. we don't have project managers anymore we do have elements of, of account management yes yeah, um, yeah. but that's that's, you know, quite often that's not undertaken by that Agile coach anyway. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. I mean, for example, if I'm on a, a project, I might give budget updates and, and stuff like that just because um, the product owner has asked for it. Yeah, and that's an account management aspect. Um, but then I might um, do account management on some of your projects by just having a, a chat with the, the client, seeing how things are going. Yeah, exactly. Just a general um, checking in. Yeah, and it's, it's not something I, I have to do as a Scrum Master, give budget updates. This is something that I, I choose to do because it's right for the situation, but I, quite easy, you know, somebody else could actually look after that. Yeah, I think it's well. really um, important to give budget updates so that the product owner can see um, exactly where their money's being spent at every throughout the sprint yeah, yeah. You know, um, otherwise they're sort of working a little bit blind well that's that's right and uh, I mean that's part of the transparency as well and that's mm. for me part of the great thing when we transition from working in the sort of a waterfall ad hoc way to mm. using scrum that was one of the best things for me being able to uh, let our clients know exactly how much they're spending and mm. what's been achieved in that time because they're going to the stand-up so they know exactly what's been worked on so it's 
I mean, there's no hiding anything. It's, it's, a, it's really easy to show that there are only painful work being done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, sort of as opposed to the um, ad hoc waterfall way of um, quoting a fixed price, fixed scope at the beginning. You yeah, know, yeah. And you know, that is the price regardless of how much work is done, whether you go over yeah. that amount of work or under. And we're working to um, an amount of money that was basically uh, educated guests, yeah. really, yeah, at the start. It's, it's, when you think about it, a crazy way to, to yeah. do things. Anyway, so that's what we like to do. Yeah, yep. Um, so something that, um, again, Joe brought up that he was wondering whether we could talk about today is um, if you get to the point uh, with a scrum team uh, where they're deciding to make changes that might be seen as breaking rules, is it really breaking rules if they all agree that it's a good idea? Uh, and I guess this, that this comes down to that, um, what is it, Shu Ha Reed, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Um, do, do you want to explain that? No, I can't remember the three stages. <laughs> okay, well, well, I, I, I remember them. Good, uh, go ahead. Pretty much so. Shu Ha Ri, is it? Yeah, yeah so, so it's um, taken from martial arts, exactly. Yeah. I'm not sure what, what specific martial arts. But at the start, you just follow the rules explicitly yes. because you're new to it and you're new to this you know, martial arts or you're new to scrum, so you just follow the rules exactly as they, they, they're done. And then you get to a stage where you're, um, the rules are kind of natural to you. That's the, the middle sort of stage and you don't have to think about them too much and it's, it's sort of like in your muscle memory. Yeah. And then you get to the third stage where you're so expert at it, you can start experimenting with things and doing your, bringing in your own aspects. Yeah, and um, so I, I think the, the answer to Joe's question is that um, you know, maybe your team is uh, at that re stage, you know, yeah, where they're yeah. able to um, decide how to do things that doesn't maybe fall within the, the rules of Scrum. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose it depends what it is, because if people want to break yeah. through, if they say we don't want to do retrospectives anymore, I think that would be, that would be damaging, idea. you know. Yeah. But, um, but I mean, it does happen. I mean, there's a project I was on um, when I was quite new to Boost where um, they decided they, they were going to um, stop having the product done in a retrospective. Which is it's uh, not a great yeah. idea, but you know it, it happened, and um, so we kind of it was an internal team, and we and we left it for a, a couple of couple of goes, um, but then we found that um, team members were going to the product owner and suggesting changes to the the way the project was being run, in between retrospectives. Mm. So they kind of realised they needed that time to speak to the product owner yeah. and, and talk about changes and they invited that person back in. And I'm curious actually, and Joe, I don't know, was there any rules specifically that you were thinking of that were being broken in that project? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, it's just, um, it, it was concerns to at the end of a uh, project. Mm. And um, the product owner wanted to reorganize the, um, the priorities and okay, yeah, stories yeah. and stuff like that. So the team was all okay with it. So they wanted to reprioritize the sprint backlog, or yeah, the sprint backlog, yeah. Okay. And, and the team was fine. In fact, the team suggested it. And well, since everyone was okay with it, I didn't see a reason. Not I think yeah, that's that's probably okay, as you know, because they're not taking things out of the sprint. People are still having the same commitment, yeah. right? Yeah, and I'm not sure if people can hear Joe there, I'm but. But um, so yeah, they just had a situation where um, they th were reprioritizing, reprioritizing mid sprint, and the team were okay with that. Mm. And at the end of the day, it's for the team, and the team mm. can, I mean, self organizing, they can make their own decisions. So yeah. it was also at the end of the, like the last sprint of the project. The last sprint so of the project, yeah. So they, yeah. they had a different concept of MVP once they started working on that. Yeah, so some, so some um, things emerged during that last sprint. Um, and everyone agreed that actually the priorities needed to change from the sounds of it. Mm -hmm. Just nodding now. <laughs> and um, we just have a few minutes left. Just wanted to talk about one of the last topics that we had. And this is something that came up pretty well. And it was a curious one because I never really um, came across it before, uh, but extending sprints. And this person said, well, you know, we've gotten to the end of the sprint and we hadn't finished all the story, so we extended the sprint for another week. Mm. Um, and and that actually, thought, when that person brought that up, I think we were all a little confused. We were like, why, why, what does it do to your velocity, yeah, you yeah. know, and uh, why would you do it? What are the reasons? Yeah. And we had to have quite a long discussion about it. Yeah, the end, yeah. And, uh, I mean, a sprint is time boxed for a r really good reason, you know. Mm. So, I mean, you, you've got that regular um, sort of cadence, I suppose. Mm. And um, if you don't finish your stories, 
that's it. And maybe you talk about at the retrospective why that, that didn't happen, what you can do to avoid that. Maybe you're over committing or maybe something else happened throughout the sprint. But extending yeah. the sprint until you finish the stories, then you're just... It's, it's, I think it's, it's potentially it's, really confusing. Yeah, and I don't want to sound like some strict scrum evangelist or anything, but it's not scrum at that point if you're just extending no, your sprint no. according to... You know, and you don't get that retrospective which says, um, why didn't we finish the story? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, because it's um, delayed by a week or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, that that rhythm that you come to rely on of every two weeks is out by a week. Yes, yeah. It's going to confuse your release planning as well. Mm -hmm. um, to me, it's just a sort of seems like a bad idea all round. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Gareth says, sounds like a missed opportunity to analyse why the stories weren't finished. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, quite, quite an odd decision that. So that was by the product owner. So the product owner had decided. Um, independently of the team to, to do that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I would say this is a case where um, an Agile coach would coach the product owner on why that may not be a great yeah, idea yeah. And, and, you know, what the disadvantages of that approach could mm -hmm. be. And I, I know, you know, people's morale can go down a bit when they don't finish all the stories. But, I mean, you have to learn through failure as well. I mean, mm. failure is equally as important to success in, yeah. in uh, Agile. Yeah. And you shouldn't be too down about it because these are all learning experiences and things that can be discussed mm -hmm. and you can usually get to the, the root cause of these things and mm -hmm. you know, avoid it in the future and uh, just make adjustments and continuously inspect and adapt so you can get better. And um, Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely, as Gareth said, it's, it's a missed opportunity, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. to do that analysis. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, but you, I would not extend a sprint, basically, that's... No. No, no. Um, it was an interesting discussion though. Yeah, and uh, let's see, we don't have, that's all our topics, but we do have a couple of minutes and just want to drop in uh, something really quickly because uh, another person asked us uh, recently about retrospectives and how to keep retrospectives uh, fresh mm. um, th for a long project. There are 70 sprints into their, their project, so they've done 70 retrospectives mm -hmm. and they're <coughs> finding it a little bit difficult to um, keep them fresh and I mean, there's Esther Derby's book, which is great to have a look at. There's mm. a, a retrospective wiki, but I also came across mm. a tool online recently. I can't remember the exact name of it now, but I'll post the link um, to Under. the um, details about this episode. Yeah. And it's it's quite useful. And I've come across quite a new little uh, um, activities that you can do in a retrospective. Right. And it's got, um, it's got the five stages of the retrospective. So, mm. you know, setting the stage and gathering data and so on and so forth. Um, but you can, Flick through these on the web page, and um, it's got a whole bunch of different activities for setting the stage. And then, you, if you think, yeah, I'd like to use that one today, then you go down to the next section and you can flick through all the activities. So it's like a mix and match for all the different stages. Yeah, that's yeah. brilliant because actually, I found um, when I was using Esther Darby's book, it, because it's paper book, it's quite difficult to flip back and yeah. forth and you know, and sort of match them up and write it down. I'd love to use this online where you can just sort of select and then you've That's got good. that agenda yeah. sort of for yourself in front of you. Uh, I did, gave it a go last week and um, mm -hmm. came up with a couple of new things and everybody really liked the, the new activities that we came up with. Mm. Um, uh, most of the activities in there are ones that we have used before and that we're aware of, but there's a few new ones. Mm. Um, but it's just a, a pretty good way of getting a retrospective uh, organized in your head. Mm. And even if you don't use the, all five there, it still might help inspire you to do something, and that's the main thing. If you're doing retrospectives for 70 sprints, yeah. you've got to keep it fresh and got to try and get um, you know good information yeah. and good goals out of people I each think, time. Um, Joe did something quite nice the other day with a retrospective. I mean, you know, they all have the same sort of principles, like what you're trying to achieve, mm. but he just framed it in a, in a different way, that's which the, can make all the difference. So, so the reality as show, a reality TV show. Yeah. So you know, even just um, kind of changing the setting for it can make a big difference mm. to sort of um, pique people's curiosity yeah. and um, provoke them to speak about different things. Um, so Gareth says here, what about Toyota style Carter? I'm not sure <laughs> what that is. Toyota style. Toyota style Carter, K-A-T-A. K-A-T-A. So uh, is that? Um, uh, uh, um, yeah, that's Carter's the sequence for um, martial arts, right? Oh, okay, okay, I'm not, I'm not too sure about that. Doing it years I'd ago. actually like more information about that. Yeah, yeah. so Carter is a sequence of moves that you put together. Um, yeah, and it isn't a Toyota who, um, say on the factory line, if, if something went wrong, they were whoever 
um, was found that she was, was able to stop the whole factory line and then everybody it's grouped changing. together and everything mm -hmm. would stop and they'd be able to fix the problem and keep going I don't know if that's yeah, what he's yeah, talking about or not. but we've got another question actually yeah. <laughs> um, so Tony says any suggestions for retro targeted at the importance of having multiple smaller stories so smaller batch sizes mm -hmm. instead of one huge story in a sprint um, I seem to remember we have an exercise that you can do um, to demonstrate this can I remember what it is Joe can you help me yeah the the batch coin exercise yeah so there's the exercise we do with the um, coin flipping which we can put a description on afterwards but it might be something you can just um, get the team together um, and do for 10-15 minutes rather than doing it during a retro but yeah. basically it's um, you've got 10 coins in front of you and you ask the people to um, flip over or toss um, 10 coins and then note down whether they're head or tails um, and pass it down the line to the team once they've done 10 um, and then record how long that took. And then in the next round, you ask them to do five at a time, is it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and pass them on, then do the next five. And then in the third round, you ask them to do one coin toss at a time and note it down and pass it to the next person. So you're reducing the batch size and then you can see, um, you can also see that it reduces the variability between, you have two teams, reduces the variability between the two teams in terms of time as well. Probably that's a very rushed explanation, but I will, we will post an explanation afterwards. And also we've uh, played a game a couple of times recently, the paper plane game, which is uh, quite good for showing how limiting people's work in progress and batch size can actually improve productivity. It's really and fun as quality. well. It's fun, so I'll, I'll post a link to that as well. Yeah, we've done that a couple of times in the last couple of weeks. And yeah. um, you know, from the outside watching you guys in the meeting, there's a lot of laughs out of that one. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, also we released a white paper um, about a fortnight ago, which talks a little bit about batch size and limiting your work in progress and how um, that actually improves the quality and productivity as well. So we'll post that as well. Um, we've got quite a lot of stuff to post to the... Yeah, and Gareth's got something as well. I'm just going to ask him to email it to me. Oh yeah, cool. And we'll stick it up afterwards, Gareth. But, but uh, um, I suppose you asked in a retrospective, how is there any activities that can get people to talk about that? And I suppose in a retrospective, it, you can, we do base it around um, themes yeah, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes the Agile coach decides um, to pose one question at the start of the retro and, and so everyone can bear in mind that one question yeah. when they're doing the activities. But uh, I suppose if people at least get an understanding of why um, limiting the batch size and the working process, progress is going to be advantageous, that's going to um, help them so they need that information first it'll be a little bit hard, hard for people to just bring up in a retrospective if they don't have the information as I to think why. That's, that's why if you did something like the coin game which is fairly quick yeah. it, it makes it really apparent really quickly. Doesn't yeah. it? Um, and we do also have um, quite a good diagram for a flow diagram for splitting up stories if you do have yes. stories that are too long. We'll post it before but we'll post that again. Yeah, um, yeah. When Paul I'll post all the links straight after this so they're because when they're fresh in my memory as well. Yeah. Um, so that's just a really good diagram how to split up stories and you, you have a starting point and then it branches out into many it's far too complicated to actually describe here. <laughs> no, no. Um, but it's pretty useful if you do find yourself having a lot of mm -hmm. stories that are too large on a, on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. So, so hopefully, we'll hopefully that, that helps um, Tony, particularly once we post the links. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah. cool. So I think that's it for today. Yeah. Okay, All right. excellent. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks watch. for watching. See you next time.